Well, good morning and uh, welcome to the Center for Global Development. Uh, let me start off by saying how excited we are today to welcome USAID Administrator Samantha Power here for an important speech on global health, future of global health. And for those of you who have uh, been following CGD for many years, you know that working on global health has been a core part of our DNA pretty much from the get-go. And, and that's uh, uh, for us a, a very important topic. For the last uh, three or so years, of course, discussions on global health have been very much driven by the pandemic, the response to it, the consequences of it, how countries will recover from the, the long-term scars and how much more difficult it is for uh, countries that were already challenged in fiscal space to be able to now pick up and not just prepare for the next pandemic, but also uh, deal with the issues uh, in terms of the, the rest of the global health agenda that was always there. And I think that's in a way the big challenge that now faces us is that while there is clearly a follow-up on the uh, pandemic and how we prepare for uh, strengthening resilience for the next one, there's uh, also a long-standing global health agenda and how we manage the two will be key. So we're very much looking forward to how USAID uh, is going to take this forward under her leadership. Uh, and also, I'm very happy to say uh, that we have here today uh, the Assistant Administrator uh, for Global Health at USAID, uh, Dr. Atul Gawande. Atul, very happy to have you here. And so the plan now is that we're going to have uh, Administrator Power first give her perspective and vision on this. Then uh, we're going to sit down and have a conversation with her, with uh, Atul Gawande and with my colleague, uh, Amanda Glassman, who is the Executive Vice President here at CGD, but also who has been herself uh, a driving force on the uh, global health agenda for many years. Before uh, inviting uh, Administrator Power to the stage, uh, let me just say, I'm not going to do an, uh, an introduction uh, of you, but I will just say one thing, if I may, which is that uh, when you were uh, nominated when you arrived uh, at uh, USAID, I think it's fair to say there was a great deal of anticipation in the development community. I was driven by the profile that you brought, uh, built through years in, in journalism, in human rights advocacy, and of course your service uh, as the uh, US uh, administrate, ambassador to the United Nations. Uh, and I think there was an expectation with, this, with that profile you would elevate not just the work of the agency but the work of development. And, and many also expected that given your track record you would bring also greater ambition to the work of the agency itself. I think it's fair to say that looking back now, uh, I think we've been proved right on both those counts. Uh, <laughs> so uh, we're very much looking forward to that. And I'd like to welcome you, Administrator Power, to, to the stage for your remarks. Thank you. Thank you. So much. Thank you so much. I was in some suspense there as to where, <laughs> where that was going. And I'm sitting next to my ch chief of staff, Dennis Vega. I was going to blame him if... Uh, <laughs> if we had dashed expectations, but um, you know, we're getting there. And uh, I have the privilege of being two years into my job. I have assembled um, a, a tremendous team and of course what predated uh, the political appointees arrival at USAID uh, is such a remarkable workforce with such dedication and rigor. And um, so I think we're, we're on a track. We have a lot more uh, that we're aiming to get done. I do want to talk about, uh, for a second, about uh, one of the tremendous leaders we have at USAID, and that is Atul Gawande. Um, I see a lot of nodding out there. I'm, I don't know how many of you got into uh, the field of global health or work on issues related to health, because you might have read something that Atul wrote uh, a long time ago or more recently. Um, but we just couldn't feel more privileged at USAID, and I speak for people not only here at headquarters, but 
out in the missions uh, to have uh, a tool as part um, of our team, uh, such a thought leader, such a visionary, such a curious person as well, uh, notwithstanding all of the ideas that he's put out there, uh, or in fact, probably the, re the way he's able to put out so many ideas is just going around and asking such thoughtful questions and really listening. Uh, and really trying to understand what stands in the way uh, of the kinds of results that, that we all seek. So Atul, thank you for coming to USA. Thank you for being such a great partner uh, to me personally. Can't wait to, to uh, discuss some of the issues that I'll be laying out here in this speech uh, with you and, and engage with the audience. Um, and President Ahmed, in addition to being relieved at how you ended your introduction, um, I would just say also thank you for forgiving us from trying to recruit uh, from this amazing institution. Some of your very best, uh, but uh, even those we haven't managed to lure, we continue uh, to learn from. Uh, so many of us at USAID have little interruptions in our calendar where we are tuning into some event that you are doing or we are taking home with us every night some, some briefing paper or some reflection that you have on these cross-cutting issues. Uh, so, uh, you know, if we are able to, to really uh, make a dent and enhance our, our impact in the world, it will be in large measure because we learn from you and, and the team that you've assembled here and, and all of the great research and scholarship as well that you incentivize uh, well beyond these walls. Um, so. This is a, a great partnership, and, and I feel, again, really, really lucky uh, to be here among you. So for decades, uh, CGD has led a brilliant project uh, called Millions Saved uh, that analyzes the impact of various global health interventions. The central, unassailable finding from that research is that, as they put it, global health works. It just works. <laughs> And the people at CGD have vital insights about how to make global health keep working, even in the face of daunting new challenges. So I am really, really looking forward to uh, our discussion today. I want to start us off today with a thought experiment. Imagine, instead of coming out every day, the newspaper came out only once a century. Imagine what the headline might be today. Would it be the Allies win World War II, Hitler defeated, man lands on the moon, DNA is discovered? Well, the science writer, Stephen Johnson, suggests another headline, that over the past century, human life expectancy doubled. Think about that. Human life expectancy doubled. At the start of the last century, the average human life expectancy was in the mid-30s. Today, it is more than 70. Think again about how incredible that is. At the beginning of the 20th century, about one in three children died before they made it to their fifth birthday. Turn to your left right now. Turn to your right. One of you wouldn't have made it past the age of five. Nearly every family had to endure the unthinkable agony of losing a child. That is, until we began one of the greatest stories of progress of our time. And the story, as you well know, starts with a series of remarkable scientific innovations. Scientists discover antibiotics that make diseases that were once a death sentence, like tuberculosis, manageable and treatable. They develop safer methods for helping women and babies survive the risks of childbirth. They craft vaccines that protect people from deadly illnesses, helping to stop the spread of diseases right in their tracks. But initially, these innovations are only available in the rich world. So by 1970, life expectancy in some of the richest countries is already nearly 70, while in the poorest, it has barely budged. But then, over the next 50 years, we see exceptional coordination across governments around the world and across the aisle right here in Washington, D.C. And in so doing, we see the gap between rich and poor nations closing. We see these innovations reaching billions of people. Now, these efforts 
to be clear, nor uh, haven't been perfect and nor have the results. Today, life expectancy remains about 18 years higher in rich countries than in poor ones. But overall, progress has been extraordinary because of that global effort to extend humanity's greatest life-saving innovations to the furthest reaches of the planet, in the last 30 years alone, maternal mortality fell by 40%. Child mortality fell by 60%. And the world's average life expectancy climbed up to the mid-70s, the story, really, of the century. As Johnson himself put the headline, humanity gives itself an extra life. Humanity gives itself an extra life. Today, however, the world faces a question. Will that incredible story of progress end with us? Because if you look at the graph of human life expectancy, you see it going up, up, up for decades until the year 2020, when suddenly the line looks like it is falling off a cliff. Average global, global life expectancy stops its upward climb and falls instead by two years, the biggest drop since China's Great Famine claimed an estimated 30 million lives in the late 1950s. We all know, of course, what happened. President Ahmed alluded to it in the year 2020. We've all lived it. COVID ravaged communities around the world. COVID overwhelmed health clinics disrupted routine treatments and preventive care, and killed millions. Now, COVID-19 is very close to becoming a manageable endemic disease. And last week, President Biden signed legislation ending the national COVID-19 emergency. So it is tempting to think that this trend line will just jump right back up to where it was heading before the pandemic. But the sad fact is it will not. COVID didn't just attack individual immune systems, it attacked our societal immune system, weakening health systems around the world and making it unlikely that we will simply recover our upward march once the pandemic is over. Our weakened health systems are facing growing stresses, an increase in conflict to rates that we haven't seen since the Cold War is disrupting the treatment and prevention of all diseases. Our changing climate is driving an increase in health conditions like malaria and heat stress. And the global food crisis is upping rates of malnutrition, which is a contributing factor in nearly half of childhood deaths. So now we see some of humanity's worst killers back at large. After the largest backsliding in childhood vaccinations in three decades, children are dying in their beds from measles, an entirely preventable disease, as global cases spike by a frightening 80%. Health clinics are once again becoming overwhelmed with cholera patients as outbreaks emerge in the wake of climate-driven disasters tainting the water in 30 countries, including some that hadn't seen a cholera outbreak in decades. And after the pandemic disrupted polio vaccination efforts, wild polio, once gone from the African continent, has returned, setting back the global effort to eradicate the disease. But today's leaders have the power to get this progress back on track. To do so, we will need to take on the underlying challenges that are straining our health systems, helping communities adapt to a changing climate and transition to clean energy to prevent further destruction, building food systems to withstand disasters like drought and floods, and of course, preventing conflicts and fostering stability. I feel so privileged to work at USAID because USAID is investing on all of these vital fronts. And one can't talk about health without, again, putting it in that larger context. But in the health space specifically, what I'm here to talk about today we must build resilience by uniting in pursuit of three foundational goals. First, we must finish the fight against the disease that caused the downturn in life expectancy in the first place. 
by turning COVID into a manageable illness everywhere. Second, we need to build up our health security defenses against new outbreaks and future pandemic threats. Since the same risk factors that caused COVID to spread across the planet remain very much with us. And finally, we will need to rebuild the resilience of our health systems by investing in the people who form the backbone of these systems, our always essential primary health workers. So first, make and keep COVID a manageable disease. After so many years of COVID dominating our conversations and our days and our fears, many people are frankly just tired of hearing about it. But that sense of COVID fatigue means that many have also missed some inspiring developments. In 2021, President Biden committed to making the United States the arsenal of vaccines for the world. And working with the Global Vaccine Distribution Alliance, COVAX, U.S. government agencies have worked tirelessly to fulfill that vision. USAID managed the donation of more than 680 million COVID-19 vaccines to more than 100 countries, helping to end the worldwide shortage of doses. And we launched GlobalVax, an initiative to help overcome barriers to delivery of vaccines across those countries. Local leaders worked to strengthen distribution infrastructure. They worked to recruit and train healthcare workers so as to get those shots into arms. And companies use their global supply chains to provide cold storage for vaccines and to keep them from going bad. And these partnerships have led to some incredible success stories. In just the first five months after the start of the U.S. government's partnership with the country of Tanzania, for example, on its vaccination campaign, which started in June 2022, COVID-19 vaccination coverage jumped from 15 percent, and that's what got all the headlines, and the headlines haven't really changed, to 94 percent of the eligible population. In Zambia, while few, again, in this country were watching, Coverage jumped from 4% in 2022 to over 75% of the eligible population in just one year. In the countries that receive vaccines through COVAX, COVID vaccines saved 7.5 million lives in the first year alone. With each passing day, however, there is a greater risk of running into the central irony that has gotten in the way of fighting so many outbreaks in the past the desire to move on from the pandemic causes us to stop taking the very actions that allow us to move on from the pandemic. Even now, every week, thousands still die from COVID and hundreds of thousands of new cases are confirmed. In order to keep COVID from continuing to strain our health systems and cause needless suffering around the planet, nations need to be equipped with the oral antiviral medications, the rapid tests, and the vaccines that they need to make COVID a manageable endemic disease. Antivirals can have an astonishing 90% effectiveness in preventing hospitalization and death. And they provide a critical backstop if a variant emerges that evades current vaccines. Organizations like the Global Fund can help supply these life-saving treatments around the world as they have successfully done with so many other essential medications. So as we speak, USAID, in collaboration with the Global Fund and other partners, is in the midst of making the first oral COVID antivirals available in 10 low-income countries. We are also working with these countries on plans to procure generic versions of these antivirals as they start to become available which of course will make it easier for countries to afford antivirals without assistance. At the same time, USAID will keep supporting countries to meet their COVID vaccine coverage goals, focusing specifically on those who are hardest to reach and those who are highest at risk of severe illness and death. We've moved past the stage where COVID is the world's top priority, the crisis that colors every other and thank goodness for that. 
But truly learning to live with this disease requires transitioning COVID prevention and treatment into routine care and getting all people access to the extraordinary innovations that turn COVID into a manageable endemic disease. Second, we have to build up our defenses against biological threats. Keep getting and keeping COVID under control really is just the beginning. We have to build the world's capacity to prevent, detect, and respond to all infectious disease outbreaks, whether they are caused by new COVID variants, existing threats, or emerging pathogens. Disease outbreaks and urgent national security risks are urgent national security risks, and governments around the world need to treat them that way. Building up our collective defenses, again, against biological threats. The COVID-19 pandemic, as President Ahmed has pointed out, is not a black swan. The risk factors that help new pathogens emerge and spread quickly have grown, and they are still growing. As humans destroy forests and other habitats to feed and house a growing population, and as conflict and climate disasters like wildfires and prolonged droughts push animals and humans out of their existing homes, Wildlife and people are coming into closer contact with one another, making it easier, as we all know, for diseases to jump from animals to humans. And in an increasingly globalized world, these pathogens can quickly spread across communities, countries, and continents. All told, Gavi projects that the annual probability of an extreme pandemic will increase threefold in the coming decades putting the odds of a pandemic of similar severity to COVID happening during our lifetimes at nearly 40%. How do we prevent this? First, again, with innovation. Scientists have identified the most likely pandemic risks, and they are already working on the vaccines and other tools needed to stop them. The United States government is investing in these efforts. For instance, we have made a $150 million commitment to the Coalition for Epidemic Preparedness Innovations to help develop the next generation of vaccines. But having the right tools to take on a pandemic won't do the world much good if we fail to detect and respond to outbreaks in the critical early phase before exponential growth of a pathogen makes containment impossible. We know that when we combine the expertise and resources of the CDC and USAID, we can be powerful partners when emergencies strike. Last year, USAID launched an outbreak response team that works with the CDC and the State Department to surge support at the first sign of crisis. Already this team has sprung into action to help quell outbreaks fast. After an Ebola outbreak in Uganda in September 2022, for instance, our team delivered thousands of sets of personal protective equipment, provided crucial information on recognizing and preventing the spread of illness to 7 million people, and offered mental health support and assistance for survivors reintegrating back into their communities, combating the terrible stigma that keeps so many from seeking life-saving care. Some predicted at the beginning of this outbreak in Uganda that it might become one of the worst Ebola outbreaks in history. Instead, it was snuffed out in less than three months. But being able to respond to just one crisis in this world is not enough. When many health emergencies are happening at once, when there's, say, an Ebola outbreak in one country and a spike in waterborne disease because of flooding in another, we need to be able to put out several simultaneous fires. So today, I am announcing a new initiative that will help us tackle multiple crises quickly at one time. It's called the Global Health Emergency Response System. I know that a new system may not sound like the most exciting thing in the world, but USAID's long history of marshalling, marshalling rapid and effective responses to humanitarian crises 
has taught us that success in an emergency relies on just that. It relies on having a system in place to rapidly deploy surge funding and staff and to coordinate a response across relevant bureaus at USAID and across our large uh, US government. The new global health emergency response system is going to help us do just that. But even more important than bolstering the US's own response capabilities, we'll be building greater capacity in all nations so that they can prevent, detect, and respond to outbreaks. The World Health Organization has spelled out the core capabilities that all countries should have in order to keep safe. Local scientists need to be able to conduct disease surveillance, testing water and sewage for pathogens, for example, and looking for unusual patterns of disease in the people who are coming through health systems. Healthcare workers need to be able to recognize warning signs, report unusual symptoms, and use the protective equipment and the protocols that help contain a threat. And citizens need to understand when they should visit a clinic. And they need to trust that they won't be ostracized if they do catch a contagious disease, but instead will be treated with care and dignity. The United States and other partners are investing in helping countries build these capabilities. Under President Biden's new national def biodefense strategy, the US government is committed to supporting 50 countries to achieve international standards in their ability to, to prevent, detect, and respond to emerging infectious disease threats. And last year, the G7 collectively committed to support 100 countries in these efforts. We've also worked with the World Bank and the WHO to establish a pandemic fund to drive greater investments in health security and break the typical cycle of panic and neglect, which we know so well, in the wake of health emergencies. The US has contributed $450 million so far, which in turn has helped unlock $1.6 billion in total investments. But the WHO and the World Bank estimate that the annual funding gap in pandemic preparedness is a whopping $10 billion. President Biden has requested another $500 million in the FY24 budget request to help meet this need. And I really hope that more governments will step up and contribute to closing this gap. We know these investments in health security work. We saw that recently in the DRC. In 2018, Ebola hit the eastern part of the country, circulating for at least four months before it was detected. 2,287 people are reported as having died. But then, starting in 2019, the DRC worked on strengthening its outbreak response capabilities, an effort that we at USAID were thrilled to be able to support alongside the CDC. We worked together to improve lab testing, surveillance, and reporting, and to distribute a life-saving new Ebola vaccine. And we partnered with the brave community health workers to help them recognize disease warning signs and respond safely when new threats emerged. Well, Ebola hit the Eastern DRC again last year, but this time it didn't take four months to detect the virus, it took 48 hours. Instead of thousands of casualties, there were five. The COVID pandemic showed that health risks anywhere are a threat to people everywhere. We can either let ourselves be scared by that fact and retreat into ourselves, or we can come together and strengthen the health and safety of all communities. And the last thing we need to do, third and finally, if we are to continue the past century's story of global health progress, invest in the people who have been driving this progress all along. This story of progress has both villains and heroes. And historically, the global health community has tended to focus our efforts on the villains, the diseases that cause unnecessary death and suffering all around the world. The global health community 
has long organized our investments, our campaigns, and even our bureaucracy primarily by disease. And we have seen remarkable successes from taking on the most deadly killers. In our own government, the President's Malaria Initiative has helped save nearly 12 million lives. PEPFAR's work to turn the tide against HIV AIDS has helped save more than 25 million. Multilateral efforts, too, have had great success by combating specific diseases. The Global Fund to Fight AIDS, Tuberculosis, and Malaria has helped save an astonishing 50 million lives. So focusing our efforts on the villains has led to very substantial impact, and we will need to continue and bolster these efforts. But there aren't just villains in this story. There are heroes, too. Heroes who we tend not to focus on much at all. We do sometimes celebrate, <clears throat> as we should, the great scientists who drove the breakthroughs that helped us take on these diseases in the first place, and the leaders who convinced the world to commit to distributing them. But their efforts would not have changed the world without the millions of primary health care workers who bring this essential care to people around the planet. These workers cross rope bridges in isolated mountain communities in Nepal to extend the reach of childhood vaccines to the world's most remote places. They race on motorbikes through crowded cities to provide life-saving care to women in labor. They build relationships with communities by listening to people's concerns, by building trust, by offering care and advice to reduce suffering and to help people meet their fullest potential at every stage of life. And when health crises strike, they go to the front lines to keep their communities safe. I will personally never forget visiting Sierra Leone at the height of the Ebola outbreak there in 2014. Cases were growing ex exponentially. You all remember this well. 40% of people who caught the disease at that point were dying from it. The director of the CDC, Tom Frieden, told me at the time he had never seen a disease of this lethality spread so fast. The risk was so real that when I began to organize a trip to the affected countries as U.S. ambassador to the U.N., my own family begged me uh, not to go. Yet on my trip, I visited a health worker training center that the United States and the United Kingdom were running in partnership with the local government where masses of people were queuing up, offering to spend their days working closely with infected patients. I asked them what was motivating them to join the fight, and one of them responded, if we leave our brothers and sisters to die, who knows, it might be us next. It is a point of duty. Heroes. And when I say we haven't focused enough on them, I don't just mean that we haven't seen or celebrated their contributions as much as we should, although we haven't. I mean we haven't invested enough in them. Today, Africa has a quarter of the world's burden of illness, but just 4% of its health workers. Many of these workers are significantly underpaid or not paid at all, a common phenomenon. When a profession is dominated, as primary health care is, by women. A recent report found that in total, six million women in the global health workforce are either grossly underpaid or not paid at all. Six million. When you are providing life-saving care, there should be no such thing as working for free. A lack of adequate compensation furthers gender inequality and, of course, it makes it impossible to recruit and retain the workforce that communities need, particularly when you consider the fact that these frontline workers can be exposed to harassment, to violence, to disease, and that they often lack the basic protective gear they need to stay safe. The WHO reports that 55 countries already face dangerously low shortages of healthcare workers eight more countries than were struggling with this challenge before the pandemic. 37 of these countries are in Africa. When we strengthen primary health care, we make virtually all of our programs to fight individual diseases more successful. 
Since primary health care workers are the ones who carry out our campaigns against everything from HIV to malaria to TB. And primary care workers don't just fight disease, they build community health. They offer family planning tools so that families can choose to have children when it's healthiest for them. In Ghana, for example, when we funded primary health workers in a randomized trial, the share of families choosing to use contraception increased by a third which in turn helped cut child mortality in half. Primary healthcare workers promote mental health. Over a billion people suffer from some kind of mental disorder, yet governments spend, on average, just 2% of their health budgets on mental health care. Primary healthcare workers can help meet this urgent need. More than 80% of people with mental health conditions can be treated effectively by properly trained primary health care workers. And on top of all that, primary health care workers are essential to our pandemic preparedness efforts. Because of the relationships that they uniquely develop with communities, they can help spot diseases as they emerge and pivot quickly to administer treatment in the face of an outbreak. The good news is that many countries have shown an enormous willingness to take on this problem and to invest in building up their primary healthcare systems. They are recruiting more primary healthcare workers and equipping them with the tools, the resources, and the facilities they need to do their jobs well. Give one example, Indonesia. Indonesia has been steadily increasing its investments in primary healthcare. They are now spending over 25% of their health budget on primary healthcare. And I think that's up from 10% not long ago. In the coming years, they plan to invest 50% of their health budget in the primary health care system, which would put a well-equipped, fully staffed primary health care center in every one of Indonesia's 75,000 villages. Imagine. And we have seen strong commitments to improving health care systems like Indonesia's from many other nations as well. But building primary health care systems requires far more substantial investment. And many are attempting to take on this challenge while resources are significantly strained in the wake of the pandemic and while many countries are gripped by debt distress. So USAID has started a new initiative called Primary Impact, which is starting out by supporting seven countries as they work to strengthen primary care. Cote d'Ivoire, Ghana, Indonesia, Kenya, Malawi, Nigeria, and the Philippines. Through Primary Impact, we are working with these governments to develop action plans that identify their most pressing needs in the primary care systems. And then, as they strengthen their investments, we will work collectively to fill the gaps created by the silos in our own funding. We will also critically coordinate with the World Bank and other funding partners around the world to help countries meet these pressing needs. Our goal is to get survival rates for children under five and women under 50 in these countries back to better than pre-pandemic rates by 2025. That's soon. To meet that goal, we are going to need to offer more support to help implement these action plans once we have established them. And to get progress back on track more broadly, we need to see action like this, not just in these initial seven partner countries, but across the world. Fortunately, President Biden has recognized this need and he's launched the Global Health Worker Initiative. If Congress commits to making this vision a reality, we will be able to support more countries that are investing in their health workforce with the training and the tools that these workers need to be effective. But we do need other nations in the G7 to commit to investing in primary care. As you heard, we have seen incredible commitments to invest in global health security and emergency response, commitments that we know we'll need to build on in the years ahead, but now we need a matching commitment for everyday primary care. 
Research shows that scaling up affordable primary health care across low- and middle-income countries by 2030 could save 60 million lives and increase average life expectancy by 3.7 years. That is the kind of action that we need to get progress back on track. A century ago, as millions of formerly healthy young people lay dying around the planet during the great influenza pandemic of 1918, it would have been almost impossible to imagine that the next century would bring about the global health miracle of doubling life expectancy. But we learned our lessons and use that pandemic recovery to spur extraordinary progress on exactly the same fronts that we need to focus on today. Turning the illness that caused that pandemic into a manageable disease, improving outbreak response, and extending basic primary care to more people. That was the playbook. In the years after the great influenza pandemic, we kept up the fight against the flu, even as the emergency receded, developing better treatments and vaccines, stunning gains that advanced modern medicine. We began coordinating our health efforts to improve our emergency response. In the 1920s, U.S. states began a national disease reporting system, and countries came together to open an international bureau for fighting epidemics. That was, of course, the predecessor to the WHO. And we extended primary care to more people. Before the great influenza pandemic, most doctors were either self-employed or worked for charities or churches. Many people didn't have access to health care at all. After the flu emergency, however, many nations created or revamped their health ministries, extending basic care to people who had never had access to it before. These investments didn't always appear transformative in the moment but they set in motion a rush of global health progress that changed the course of human history. Today, we too can learn lessons from this period of crisis and use the lessons of the pandemic to build up not just individual immunity, but our societal immunity so that this remarkable story of progress does not end with us, but builds for future generations to come. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Administrator Power. That was a hugely important speech, a really a benchmark speech for our sector and global health, and as you called it, the story of the century that we have to keep the pages turning on. Um, I'm really grateful to have the opportunity to sit down and have some moments for questions, and we're also going to go to the audience, and we're joined, of course, by the Assistant Administrator for Global Health and Just Basic Health Celebrity. Dr. Atul Gawande. I recommend his documentary. Um, OK, so I'm going to kick off with a couple questions. First, you've outlined a call to action around the decline in life expectancy and stalled progress on global health goals, a three-part agenda. USAID is already playing a role. But a question to you is, how might USAID reimagine your approach to partnership? Um, you know, We know that in 2022, US health money only went direct to governments uh, in about four countries, about $43 million. That's about one, less than 1% of US global health spend. Uh, you've already committed to working more with local partners and governments, potentially. So how are you thinking about that, especially because you talked about the fiscal distress that some countries are under. You talked about the need to pay community health workers, potentially through public budgets. How would this be managed? How can we reimagine partnership? Great. Well, I, I will start, and then we'll get our real expert uh, to weigh in here and maybe offer some examples of what we're already doing, I think, in this vein. Um, so first, uh, we are, as an agency, trying to shift resources to more local partners. So that's a whole separate uh, conversation, but it very much graphs on to this one in setting a target of having 25% of U.S assistance flow to local partners by 2025 and for 50% of our assistance by the end of the decade 
to be the product of local partnership, co-design, co-evaluation, co-implementation. We, we're moving in that direction. It's very slow. The barriers to entry are fairly substantial. Our compliance requirements uh, up on the hill are prohibitive mm -hmm. uh, for many lo local partners. There's still a lot of skepticism in certain quarters here in the United States about the reliability of G to G. Um, but I think, and maybe Atul can say more about this, I think PEPFAR has really paved the way and, and shown just how doable it is. I mean, people would have thought that those targets were unachievable. I think they were very, it's been you know hard on the system to get there so quickly. Uh, but one of the things that we've done in our broader agency-wide look at localization is try to study how have our how have our PEPFAR uh, programs managed uh, to move in that direc direction so much more quickly than we have managed in other mm -hmm. sectors? So let me just I'd say that at the outset. Second, um, you know, our broad approach at USAID, um, really born of necessity, um, uh, because of the gap between public sector resources and all the needs out there. I mean, we spoke today about health, but I could give a food security speech that would sound a lot like this. I could give a democracy and governance speech that would sound just in terms of those, those gaps and the needs for those, those gaps to be filled. So we're trying to sort of shift the mindset, and, and, and we've learned this really from many trailblazers at USAID who are already doing this, but from a what do we get from Congress and what do we do with it to what are the problems we're trying to solve? How do we graft our resources against those problems? And even if we have no resources, if it's the problem that we know needs solving, we're the United States. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, we're a major player in every major multilateral institution. We're the largest donor in most of them. Um, we have thought leaders, uh, you know, uh, li like a tool. We draw on research. Uh, from, from people like you and, and people here at CGD and elsewhere. I mean, we have a lot to offer even before we reach into you know, the, the coffers uh, or to what Congress has, mm -hmm. has appropriated to us. And that sounds kind of obvious, I know, maybe if, if you're not in government, but because program management is so time consuming and so elaborate, it really can actually you know, cause one to focus on the kind of four corners of whatever that program is you're managing. So. So this is a shift. We're, we're trying to change the incentives at USAID. So you also, even in promotion, kind of get credit mm -hmm. for cooking something up with the World Bank or the private sector alongside you know, what you might be doing, again, within the, the dedicated program space. So here, I think on the, on the health worker side or on the primary health side, one of the biggest players is the World Bank. Mm -hmm. um, I think we're already seeing, you know, they, they already have those pre-existing relationships, but you know, if we are working with countries to develop these action plans, then being in a position to work with those countries to be putting forward proposals, actionable proposals, very specific proposals, mm -hmm. proposals that are well uh, uh, thought through. If some training has gone on, there's the training of the health workers, but then there's also training of the people who are actually figuring out how to appeal to the large MDBs or mm -hmm. to other institutions. So there's that kind of catalytic role that we can play. And we've appealed to Congress mm -hmm. <laughs> to provide us with additional resources that will allow us as well to be doing more, more direct funding. But Atul, do you want to speak to some of this underway in, in our seven primary impact countries? Yeah. Um, uh, well, first of all, the first thing I think of is to say, how lucky are we to have someone as formidable as Samantha Power um, coming in to talk on health? <laughs> I took this job in large part because of Samantha, someone who understands diplomacy, who understands humanitarian advocacy, and the power of what that can create when you know you have zero budget <laughs> much of your career, um, and knowing how you can create change there. You know, I bring health, I get to learn how we can do all of this. And I see examples, um, I'll, I'll talk about two. I, I, Ukraine was my first big education in, in all of this. And, um, USAID played a critical role in uh, our Office of Health Systems in supporting the uh, transition of post-Soviet Ukraine to, uh, from a world of hospital-based and specialty-based care mm -hmm. to uh, have and no real uh, health coverage system, mm -hmm. no health financing system, 
to actually having a universal health coverage financing system that covers everybody in Ukraine. And that uh, technical assistance, the working through the models of how you do that, led to relationships that also helped us work on a pathway to reduce corruption. And both of those aspects of the relationships have made it so when they um, were, uh, when Putin invaded Ukraine and all the medical supplies got cut off, you know, Russia supplies and medical supplies, uh, a, a large chunk of it, and then Europe wasn't gonna, able to send into a war zone. Um, these teams were the ones who now had the relationships and ability to support a transition that could get 5,000 humanitarian aid organizations plugging in to enable a, a, a pharmacy system that works, 250,000 HIV patients needing their next month's meds to stay alive, uh, getting, getting their, their medicines and capabilities, all with reprogramming the existing funds we already had in the country mm -hmm. before we even had uh, brought in the, the, that budget. So now, um, you know, do we have a major investment yet in primary care as a solidifying uh, emphasis? No. Uh, we intend that, that we are making the case that can get there. And what we recognize is that, uh, to take the example of Indonesia that you just spoke about, um, Indonesia has made a commitment of a radical reorientation of their health system towards primary care. As Samantha said, from less than, from about 10% of their budget going to, health budget going to health care, to primary care, to 25% on the way to 50%. They have, again, with uh, uh, some uh, expert technical assistance, uh, been able to make a health financing system that has moved now down the path to universal health coverage. They are picking up the costs increasingly of HIV meds, for example, that, that, that we used to, uh, used to provide. But the bigger thing now is they are uh, leveraging over a billion dollars in World Bank loans, much more than we would ever put in. They are putting their own domestic financing on the line and taking on loans to shift towards primary care. And then we can come in to make sure that all of our programs, from HIV to malaria to uh, TB, to maternal and child health are, you know, it's the same primary care workers that are supporting delivering the babies, uh, diagnosing the tuberculosis and giving the COVID shots. And our technical assistance for the managers in their training, for improving quality of care, for, uh, and the training of the frontline workers, those are the spaces where we're able to lean in and make the difference. And then yes, every additional investment we're able to put in can target how we incentivize enabling that broader health base. Mm -hmm. Okay, and do you have an example from Sub-Saharan Africa that you could share with us? Yes, um, Ghana is a, uh, is a long USAID uh, mm -hmm. success story. Um, Ghana, so we have learned actually because of uh, a large scale randomized trial done in Ghana uh, mm -hmm. that uh, where USAID was partially supporting the um, that when you finance frontline health workers who have traditionally not been trained mm -hmm. to be trained at a level to be at least nursing level, so 18 month mm -hmm. training uh, uh, program, uh, put in enough density that they're able to touch every home at least once a year and uh, be equipped so that they are not out there on their own but are plugged into a primary health care clinic system so that primary care is not primitive care it actually is making sure that frontline community health workers are delivering the, some critical health care priorities, but then for the ones they can't meet, that they're being uh, brought into a larger system. Uh, that started as a, as a small scale uh, trial in the northern part of Ghana, and they demonstrated that within three years, they cut child mortality by 50%. That within seven years, they cut child mortality by 70%. That the, uh, that the family planning program ended up reducing the uh, birth rates by a, a full birth uh, drop in fertility rate mm -hmm. uh, in the course of that time. That then we supported uh, the technical support to scale up mm -hmm. um, the, uh, the, that to nationwide. And Ghana exceeded uh, the 70-year the life expectancy on the on a track that took you know took from the early 1990s to where we are today, that um, that kind of capability uh, is is the kind of thing that we are now 
helping Ghana secure at a time when they're in financial crisis uh, and keep on moving forward as one of our primary health care countries, uh, primary impact countries, but then also want to see that it, it's replicated in other parts of uh, African countries that have the chance to grow from that as well. Okay, great. Well, we'll watch that. I have one more question I know the audience wants to ask, but I have to ask, which is that, as you know, our U.S. global health budget is very much uh, oriented towards the killers, as, as you put it. How um, would you imagine, uh, as you think about increased primary health care or a more strategic relationship with governments, how to make all of these vertical funding flows work uh, for the objectives that we've talked about, whether it's within the USG or beyond the Global Fund, I'm Gavi, et cetera? I'll let Atul give a more fulsome answer since he's the silo breaker day to day. <laughs> um, but you know, I, do, I, I don't want it to get lost, actually, how substantial the investments we are now making as a US government in global health security are. Mm -hmm. um, because, you know, again, the temptation is panic, uh, mm -hmm. flood the zone, retreat, yeah. don't learn lessons, same thing happens, gets worse. Mm -hmm. um, so I, I think the fact that we are now have 50 countries where we're making global health security investments also creates a little bit of flexibility that's mm -hmm. a growth area. Mm -hmm. um, and th as a result, some of our objectives here in the primary health space, we're going to want to be um, uh, imbuing, you know, in, in, in mm -hmm. the work in, in the global uh, health security area. Um, I think that additionally, again, this is the first time in a long time at the very least that an administration has come forward with a, an appeal for dedicated healthcare worker resources. As of yet, we don't have the response mm -hmm. From Congress, that we would like. I mean, I mean, part of the challenge, and we'd welcome your support in in addressing this, is that constituencies are also very disease based. Mm -hmm. You know, you have a community of people who are very dedicated to the malaria cause. God love you and thank you. Um, uh, needless to say, the HIV/AIDS community and the, the the success of PEPFAR both was predated by tremendous advocacy, and then that that constituency has grown over time. This doesn't quite have. You know that that same, and, and that's on the on the on the primary side, but by even having a, a program now called Primary Impact, mm -hmm. you know we're hoping to create something that people can can rally behind. But in terms of the silos among diseases, I'd let Atul speak to that. Well, let me just say we've learned over the last twenty years how to create change in global health, mm -hmm. as uh, as as your work has said, global health works. But but how does it work? First of all, you have to be able to. Um, uh, set goals, so you have to be able to measure. So we learned in HIV, TB, polio, we need your way of measuring, in those cases, diseases, uh, then, and our progress against them. You need to orient all sections of, of the uh, community in the country, around a country plan for how you're going to attack the problem and what everybody's role in that is. And then you hammer away year by year, and it actually works. That now we're applying in global health security. Mm -hmm. We have crisp metrics for whether your labs are in the right place, whether your people are trained appropriately, and so on. And, uh, um, and, so, and so now we have $900 million in FY23 that will go toward, in, which is a, a market increase from anywhere we've ever been. Um, and, it's, and it's amazing to see that continue after the pandemic, because that's crucial. Um, and that is now making sure that we are knocking out each of those barriers one by one. In primary care, we have not had that. But over the last decade, there's been efforts. I was involved in one with uh, the World Bank and the Gates Foundation uh, called Primary Health Care Performance Initiative that established metrics that are now adopted by the WHO in the same way. We can now measure the percent of the budgets that go to primary health care. We can look at the density of your primary health workers. Mm -hmm. We can look at whether they're appropriately trained and whether they're connected into clinics in the appropriate ways, and whether the patient experiences are that they are turning to those places because they can serve the majority of their health needs instead of going around them to hospitals miles away after it's too late. And that uh, capability now, we are working with these seven countries to have national level plans on delivering on those goals, and, and we are partnered in this effort with the World Bank so that we are uh, collectively starting to make these contributions. 
uh, we can now build the, these out and demonstrate that we can get um, rally many more to mm -hmm. these causes. So we've made primary care visible, we've made it measurable, and we can now show uh, the, the components that result in better coverage of essential services like immunizations, fam family planning, t tuberculosis, et cetera. And then that, and we know how that leads to uh, improved life expectancy. Okay. So um, we're going to the audience. If you have a question, can you please raise your hand and uh, someone will bring a microphone to you. Be very, very brief. We'll collect three and go back to our illustrious panelists. Please say who you are and where you work. Hi, I'm Gautam Possibility from Biodesign Innovation Labs. I'm from India. Mm -hmm. I'm um, here at a fellowship at Halcyon. Uh, I would like to ask my question regarding the, the population growth. We can see India has exceeded the population in, uh, you know, as opposed to China. And uh, what do you think uh, for a country which is having a population of 1.4 billion people, uh, uh, you know, the healthcare should, should, uh, system should be prepared of? We've seen COVID first wave and second wave in India. And uh, as a company which, uh, you know, manufactures ventilators, we work on the medical devices. Uh, we responded to COVID-19 and have, having seen firsthand, uh, it was very overwhelming experience. How do you think uh, as a, uh, you know, as a, uh, in a country like uh, uh, India, which is a, a first, first population uh, country, how, how do we respond for next threat in the pandemic? How can we best be prepared? Yeah. Okay, thank you. Uh, here. With the, okay. uh, hi, everyone. Uh, I'm Rupa Dot from Women in Global Health. I really appreciate, uh, um, uh, Ambassador Powers, that you have uh, cited the report about six million women health workers are currently unpaid and underpaid. My question is very much related to this, um, to both of you, on how does the US government plan to address this issue, which we know is only going to worsen and is already worsening as a result uh, of the pandemic. Thank you. Thanks. And a last question. On the right side, you haven't had a chance. Right here in the middle. Here in the middle. Sorry. If you can stand up. Go ahead so they can find you. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, Tristan Reed from the World Bank. Um, there's been some attention uh, to USAID's procurement policies. You mentioned limits on being able to buy uh, services from, from firms overseas. People have also pointed out that there are uh, restraints on trade even in the United States so that in order to bid for a contract, you, you have to have worked with AID before. I was wondering if you could just say a little bit about you know, what, what you're doing to open up procurement at AID. Mm -hmm. Okay. So a big question about India. Do you, how do you advise, uh, obviously India is a strategic partner of the United States, what kind of work are you doing in the global health, pandemic preparedness? Uh, space a second on um, the approach of the U.S. government on the, the women community health workers, their payment, their adequate payment. Is there a policy agenda there? And finally, um, on what's happening in terms of procurement access, competition, um, and things like that. So, should we start? Uh, the ge the, yes. the high level person starts, and then we get to the person okay. who knows right. what they're talking that's about. Perfect. Yeah, that's okay. good. Uh, so. Um, I guess maybe I, thinking of my comparative advantage when I'm next to Atul Gawande, I, I would just pull back a little bit on the, on the first two questions, so, which in, in some ways relate to each other because it's about, in a sense, resourcing. If, if we're talking about care, uh, it's about resourcing that you know, amid a, a booming population um, with healthcare workers, uh, unpaid or underpaid, and this is where I think the work that we need to do collectively outside of the public health space is so critical to securing gains on global health. And so if you take, um, for example, you know, to come to the, the health worker uh, underpayment issue, we have countries now coming to us uh, you know, saying we would like nothing more than to increase our investments like Indonesia has done. 
we just have a problem, which is we're spending nearly half of government revenue servicing debt. <laughs> um, you know, when, when you have debt service payments that are literally crowding out basic investments in the health sector, also we hear the same in the agricultural sector for countries that are trying to, you know, uh, expand uh, agricultural productivity to be able to food them, feed themselves, especially in light of uh, high food prices. So we have actually gone to Congress and also asked for USAID to grow when it comes to core economic development programming. You, you know, as, as much as we feel under-resourced in this space, you know, if you look at PEPFAR uh, funding globally and compare it to anything we do on economic growth, inclusive growth, uh, d counseling countries as to how to engage in their debt restructuring negotiations, trade facilitation, you know, the kinds of programs that could help countries generate their own revenue to be in a position to have enough domestic resources to allocate appropriately to be, you know, true the kinds of partners that they would most wish to be in making their own investments. Um, that's about one tenth. Our investments globally are about one tenth of those in PEPFAR. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, for yeah. and and that's not to say we should in any way, you know, uh, diminish uh, what we're doing uh, in in uh, on PEPFAR. But it is to say everything is connected to everything else, unfortunately. And so there's no great answer in the long term on paying health workers that doesn't involve the fiscal health of the countries in which we work, and we just absolutely have to be much more laser focused on that, uh, given, again, the, the calamity of debt, which really is a very, very different problem today than it was even five years ago, never mind 10 years ago, when it just really wouldn't have been the gating issue. It, could, you could have, it might have been corruption, it might have been political will, it might have been military expenditures. But now this is actually really cabining uh, what people can do. And then on that score as well, I would just say that w India is a great example of where I think some of our best work, and Atul can, can speak directly to the question, but has come also by virtue of working with the government as well to incentivize private sector involvement uh, in this space. I mean, and that is where so much of the innovation has come. We saw the vaccination campaign which was the likes of which you know, I think no country has ever, has ever seen, even uh, you know, if, again, the, the health costs of the, the pandemic uh, were still tragic. So that is what our mission does, is think beyond what are we doing, I mean, given Modi's investments directly, but what are the ways that we can be catalytic um, uh, you know, when it comes to, to, to bringing other stakeholders to the table? And then I don't have a lot to say on procurement. It's a specific set of questions. We have a new acquisition strategy that really is aiming to open up this process. We do have work with, work with USAID, uh, is it .com or .gov? Uh, one of the two, try both. Uh, <laughs> but where new partners you know, are actually getting um, you know, access earlier, getting more of a sense of how to compete. Um, but this is something we know we need to, to diversify our partner base. It's something Congress pushes on. We have uh, in, uh, exceeded our target this year in working with small and disadvantaged businesses. Um, by you know two uh, percent, but that target's going to go up every year. So hopefully, again, we will see uh, more pluralism in the, in the range of, of uh, large contracting partners, particularly. Okay. Let me jump in on, on just add a little bit on the first two. On India, um, just say the experience. So my family's from India. Um, my father is from a village in Maharashtra, the Othmal district, uh, where he was a village boy in and his mother died of malaria at a time when the life expectancy was uh, just 30 years. The, the solutions existed, it simply did not get to them. The only doctors he'd ever experienced were people in white coats who came to do smallpox uh, vaccines in the 1970s, a, a, um, a major effort of USAID, of which now I'm here as a beneficiary uh, mm -hmm. of that, right? That, um, and, and brought the, the, uh, the Green Revolution that enabled um, the community that, in which my father grew up in to go from famine and you know his own family members dying from famine to being one where today India is an agricultural exporter. It is the president of the G20 this year. And now I get to be on the other side of the table negotiating <laughs> with India. And what do we talk about? The priorities of India at the G20 are primary health care and especially digital health care. 
And uh, right now, India is leading uh, a set of work uh, to build health and wellness centers that actually uh, follow through on what the evidence shows, get at least nurse or higher level workers at the community-based level integrated into more comprehensive primary health uh, centers. And, uh, and India is now past its 71-year life expectancy. The um, uh, United States is, you know, currently 76 is our last numbers. Uh, we probably will rebound to 78 or 79. And India is on a path that can uh, recover that with a strategy that includes their primary health care focus, a global health security uh, focus as well. Um, I'll say second around uh, the uh, around female health workers. The, the most important thing we can do is start paying health workers. In Africa, 85% of the health workers uh, are um, are unpaid. 85% of the community health workers are unpaid at most, just getting basic stipends, and they are well over 70% female. What we've seen in Ghana is that when you pay those health workers, you know, the 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 view is always it's too expensive. It's, you know, you can't train to a nurse level. It's, it's, uh, it's not feasible. It has demonstrably produced a, uh, a, been a driving force for the economy. Healthcare spending is not spending, it is investment in the human capital of your country, and it results in uh, your, your improved livelihood and economics for decades to come. And so that uh, economic benefit immediately redounds to the female workforce because they're such a large segment of the uh, capacity uh, and untapped capacity in our healthcare space. Okay, I think that we're at time unless you can stay a little longer. No, I mean, we I, cannot. I, I don't, I'm not In the boss. which case, I see the, 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 the shaking of the head. So, okay. thank you so much for an inspiring speech thank and you. for all your work.